Let me say good evening to everyone. I'm Leonard Hamlin, the Canon Missioner of the Washington National Cathedral. Uh, I have the great privilege and pleasure uh, to welcome everybody on behalf of the Bishop of the Washington Diocese, as well as our Dean here at the National Cathedral, uh, to open up the doors and welcome you into this sacred space that for tonight, we know will be a wonderful event of this long, long way festival. And so as you've come this evening, I hope that you have prepared really for a wonderful evening, as well as those who will be with us over these two days. As we have opportunity and you have opportunity, I hope that you will look forward to uh, an enjoyable evening of watching the film and fruitful discussion. We're thankful for our sponsors who uh, have helped in so many different ways. We'd like to thank, of course, Baylor University. Um, we th we're thankful for the Austin Film Festival and the March on Washington Film Festival. Especially, we want to say thank you to uh, Greg Garrett, who I'll be saying a little bit more about in just a moment. But we're thankful for him as a steadfast partner throughout these years. And so as we move forward into this evening and think about so many things, we know that this particular gathering has been entitled the Long, Long Way Festival. On your programs, you see Long, Long Way, but it was shortly before the passing of Dr. Martin Luther King that he made the statement and remarked that while the nation had come a long way, a long, long way in its quest for racial justice, it still had a long, long way to go. As we gather this evening, we can see how far we've come, but I think most of us would agree that we still have a long, long way to go. And we're able to make progress by what we do together. That's what this evening really affords us the opportunity to do, to work together, to think together, to relate to one another, and to think about how we have made progress, or sometimes the lack of progress, throughout the years. And so we get to do that by watching the films and having these discussions. As we come on this evening, you will notice that one of our panelists, Janet Broderick, uh, she's not able to be with us on this evening. Uh, she's under the weather and was not feeling well. Um, and so we're thankful that she is taking care of herself and she's being replaced this evening as I have been instructed by two gentlemen. So it, it took two men to replace one woman. And so as we look forward to this evening, we're just grateful that we have this opportunity. Uh, for Greg Garrett, who is coming before you tonight as a really a steadfast partner, he serves as, of course, theolo a theologian in residence at the American Cathedral in Paris, as well as a professor at Baylor University. We're thankful for the partnership that we have with him. He's going to come and talk to us more about this evening. Um, and as you view the film, let me remind many of you that you will see subtitles. Often when we are projecting sound within the cathedral, sometimes there's a little bit of a difficulty to hear. Um, that may or may not be the case this evening, but we want to have the subtitles. You'll see those on the screen that will help you this evening in your viewing of the film. And as we look forward, we're just grateful for this evening. On tomorrow, we invite you to join with us and to partake in not only the discussions, but in the viewing and the projections of all that will be lifted. So tonight, let me say welcome on behalf of all of my colleagues here at the cathedral. And it is a pleasure and a privilege to have you here and grace this space. Leonard, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your welcome. Thank you for your faithful witness. Uh, and for the work for racial justice that you and the uh, cathedral are doing, of which this program is a small part. It is a privilege to be uh, a part of it with you. I actually have several privileges uh, tonight. And uh, I bring you greetings, uh, by the way, from Waco, Texas, where Baylor University is, home of college basketball. Uh, great girls teams, great boys teams. Um, the first of the privileges that I have is that I get to uh, introduce glory in such a way that we have a, a context for it. Uh, it is, of course, a film that's now 30 years old, and it's important for us to understand some things about it. Uh, I will tell you about my second great privilege uh, after I have done that. And um, as we were doing the run-through for the show, we noticed that all of us have aging eyes. 
We have, we have given our eyes in the service of the cathedral. So here's where I want to begin. Five miles from here, in Gallery 66 of the National Gallery of Art, you can see Augustus St. Gaudens' final version of the Shaw Memorial. It was originally intended as a simple equestrian statue honoring Colonel Robert Gould Shaw. But St. Gaudens made the important decision to add the men of the 54th Massachusetts, the first regiment of African Americans enlisted in the North. And he depicted them with their faces turned toward their future as they march proudly out of Boston and toward their destiny. Like our film Glory tonight, the Shaw Memorial places Colonel Shaw front and center. And it is appropriate to ask, as Roger Ebert did in his original review of the film, why it was necessary to filter this story about the first black regiment through the white character played by Matthew Broderick. On the one hand, I have always suspected economic necessity. Without a Matthew Broderick, this film might never have been greenlighted. And although a powerful film could and probably should be made from the standpoint of the black soldiers entirely, mainstream audiences in 1989 might not have responded with the same level of interest. But the Shaw Memorial offers us a crucial insight into why glory mattered in 1989 and why it still matters today. Yes, the character of Colonel Shaw is privileged in both the sculpture and the film. And yes, this film, like Driving Miss Daisy, which came out in the same year, like Green Book, tells a familiar story of a white character who grows in awareness thanks to the people of color with whom he shares a journey. But in Gallery 66 at the National Gallery, you can view the individual portrait busts that St. Gaudens sculpted to make sure that each and every one of the African-American soldiers in the monument was an individual, that each was granted at least as much humanity as the figure of Colonel Shaw. In glory, we meet representative soldiers who have their own character arcs, who confront their own demons, and who charge Fort Wagner alongside their colonel. It may be the Shaw Memorial, but thanks to St. Gaudens work and to glory, we also see and know and remember the men of the 54th. One of the central tenets of the Long Long Way Film Festival, particularly with regard to our Friday night historical films, is that we try to identify and contextualize some issues that might be a problem for contemporary viewers. But we also try to celebrate the ways that these films continue to speak into our larger context about our shared humanity. As you watch Glory tonight then, I'd invite you to consider three broad questions for yourself. And we'll be dealing with these in various ways up here on the dais. First, in what ways does this 30-year-old film seem to be reflective of the time of its making? Are there ways, cinematic, political, racial, or social, in which it shows its age? Secondly, how does glory depict its African-American characters? That is, even if Colonel Shaw is the film's organizing figure, do Tripp, Rollins, Thomas, and other people of color get imbued with a sense of reality and purpose? And third, what does glory have to say to us in 2020? How might talking about glory help us to have conversations about race, power, war, the military, about systems that continue to regard some human beings as less worthy than others? So those are the things I'm gonna suggest that you spend some time reflecting on. Our hope always is that you will go home thinking about the conversation that you're hearing us have up here. And that leads me to the second great privilege of my night, and perhaps the reason why my life is in some way charmed, because the truth is, every February, I get to stand at a podium and introduce Corva Coleman. Now, every weekday morning, 
like many of you, I get in my car and I invite Corva Coleman to join me. Using her calm, wise words, she tells me about the news of the day, even when the news feels anything but calm and wise. This is the Corva Coleman most of you know, the Corva Coleman who comes through your speakers. But I have also had the privilege of getting to know Corva Coleman, the human being. And I can tell you that yes, she is calm and wise, but also warm and generous. She is everything that you would hope a person would be that you invite into your car. So please join me in welcoming and thanking from NPR, Corva Coleman. So now that you've just all found out we're in the world's biggest car. Thanks, Greg. Welcome. Welcome to a long, long way film series 2020. It is our third such weekend here at the National Cathedral. This event is also co-sponsored by the Austin Film Festival, the March on Washington Film Festival and Baylor University. And my thanks go to each of them for inviting me to, again, participate in this evening and in this sacred space. I'm going to introduce our panelists this evening. As you know, Reverend Janet Broderick is not with us, but let me tell you who is with us. First, the Reverend Kenny, excuse me, Kelly, I just messed you up. <laughs> You just heard an awful mistake, which I'll never make on the radio. The Reverend Kenny Kelly Brown Douglas of Washington National Cathedral and Union Seminary. Kelly, would you let everybody see you? <laughs> Greg is going to, you want to peep out here? Greg is going to join us this evening. Greg Garrett of Baylor University. And two more people I'm really thrilled to tell you about. Dr. David Taft Terry. David, would you rise? David is a historian and associate professor at Morgan State University with particular expertise in this time period. We're really going to benefit a lot from having him with us tonight. And Mr. Russell Williams, Academy Award winning sound producer, including his Oscar for this very film, Glory. Here's how our evening is going to work. We're going to next enjoy the film together, now that Greg has prepared us to view it. When the film concludes, we're all gonna stand up and take that five minute stretch because everybody needs that, including me. We will return to the dais for a moderated conversation about the film, about the issues that Greg has introduced, and about the issues that our panelists are going to talk to each other and with us about through the lens of this film. We'll wrap things up just before 10 o'clock this evening. So, all right? All right. Glory. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we are gonna talk for a little while now. My name is Corva Coleman, I'm from NPR News, and I would like to reintroduce our panelists. Immediately to my right is Mr. Russell Williams, the Academy Award winning sound producer for glory, as well as Dances with Wolves. <laughs> Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas, Cathedral Canon Theologian here at the Washington National Cathedral. <laughs> Dr. David Taft Terry, Morgan State University historian and professor. And my friend, Dr. Greg Garrett of Baylor University. So the part we're going to start with, obviously, is Russell. So. All right, Russell. Spot, huh? Yes, I am. OK, we are dying to know what you can tell us uh, in terms of large, broad strokes about making this film. Uh, Corver, thank you. Uh, thank uh, all of you all for coming out and reliving part of my life and a lot of our lives cinematically and 
actual American history done in a Hollywood uh, version. Uh, the best thing about working on Glory, uh, we shot the movie pretty much entirely in Georgia. And in Georgia, everyone can cook. <laughs> The worst part of working on Dancing with Wolves is apologies to people from South Dakota. I didn't find too many people out there that could cook. Um, there are some, certain scenes in this film that I'm missing because I know we shot them, but they didn't make the final cut. And in one of the scenes where the regiment goes to Beaufort, South Carolina, and they meet some of the abolitionists and the, and the beautiful kids there sing, uh, America the Beautiful, you're just one person away from meeting Matthew Broderick's love interest, or actually Robert Gould Shaw's love interest, a woman named Charlotte Fortin from Philadelphia. And since her whole part of the film got cut out, then of course we can't meet her. And at the end of the film, right before the 54th goes into battle, uh, the skill of the editors is really good because I knew what I recorded that day where Matthew actually goes to the Harper's reporter and says, if I should fall, please give my horse to Miss Charlotte Fortin of Philadelphia. But as it turns out, when we cut back to the reporter, that allows us to cut that line out. And he says, just remember what you've seen here. And I was like, man, that editor's good. That editor, by the way, Steve Rosenblum, cut another really fantastic film called Braveheart. Um, otherwise, from the, from the actual production of the film, most of everything you hear in the final battle scene is all post-production, it's all replaced sound because the machines we use to create the rocket's red glare and all the visual uh, bombardment basically drowned out the dialogue that we shot on the day. And that day took about three weeks and nights. Whereas when you hear the 54th doing their testimonial in front of the tree, all that a cappella singing, that's pretty much 100% my sound. They did add a tambourine in there, I noticed this time around. Uh, I probably should have noticed it before when I saw it, but they added an actual tambourine to cover up the actual tambourine that was in the scene. And the first time they meet the Confederates in the woods, that's pretty much most of my sound. All the weapons are re-recorded with real ammunition going down the barrel. So the stuff that I recorded on set was just reference for them in post-production. And that's, I'll leave it there and uh, I'll let you go to your next question, unless there's something else that you're dying to I'll hear come about. I'll back to you. <laughs> well, actually, there is something I want to jump off of, uh, and I'm going to ask Kelly. We had hoped that we would be joined tonight by um, Janet Broderick, right. uh, Reverend Janet Broderick, who uh, is the sister of the lead, Matthew Broderick, and had a hand in scripting part of this film, including a really key scene, which was the prayer meeting the night before the final battle. But Kelly, you wanted to talk about that a little bit um, in terms of what that prayer meeting meant to those men and what it means to us as viewers. Yeah, thank you, uh, Corva. Uh, that is, of course, a very powerful scene. And one of the things in conversation with Janet uh, that she said as one of the scripters and writers of that scene, of course, they did a lot of research mm -hmm. to try to be as authentic to uh, the religion and the faith uh, of previously enslaved men of the enslaved. And that what they wanted to capture, what she wanted to capture, was this sort of sense of transcendence that allowed them to, in many ways, transcend the context in which they found themselves, to transcend what it meant to be these sort of, even if they were runaway enslaved persons, these enslaved persons. And you, in fact, see that in this scene, when indeed they, some, where from inside themselves, they are able to affirm who they are as men and affirm what it means to fight, not so much for flag, not so much for the uh, North, for the Union, but for freedom. And what's so powerful to me about this scene and hearing uh, Janet talk about the way in which what they were trying to capture is they captured that and so much more because in this small but significant scene, you really see the complexity of the black faith tradition that emerged out of the enslaved community. And so you see how they, the Jesus that they are talking about is not the Jesus that was on the side of slave ships. Right. 
in that moment they are connecting themselves to this God who they have come to understand and you see it that this God never created them to be enslaved, but created them to be free. And then in the music and in the scripting and, and in, the, in the mantra, you see the fullness of their African religious heritage, if you will, coming together uh, with this Christian faith tradition, which is a full embodied understanding of who they are as free men. David, I need to skip you for a second because I want to jump to Greg. And it goes back to something that you were talking about at the beginning uh, as you were introducing us to the film, Greg. And that is we're looking back 30 years at the composition of this film. This was made and, and, and put together and given to us in 1990. And something that Kelly is, is telling us about what we are intended to see about the 54th. Um, as we ponder this, I'm also struck by the other thing that you're telling us, which is the question I always ask you every year. <laughs> Who is this film intended for? And, and that's a question that I got from Kelly that we have started asking together over the years. And so I'm very interested to see what she thinks as well. Um, but this is uh, what I think of as a sort of third stage Hollywood film about race. Um, it's, it has much more in common with Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which we showed in our first year than it does with Do the Right Thing, which came out the same year. Uh, it, it's made by sincere and well-meaning white filmmakers who want to broach the subject of racism in a way that white audiences will not turn away from. And you know, the wonderful thing about this movie is that we've got uh, an obvious entry into the film for white audiences through Matthew Broderick, but we are also given entry through all of these amazing uh, black soldiers. And you know, so as I was looking around and, and seeing the experience that people were having, I mean, this is a really diverse group and we were all involved in this story because the filmmakers gave us all somebody to care about. And basically what we're doing is we're, we're beginning the movie with this character who's writing home and saying, you know, don't imagine that any of us are gonna die. And, and we end with Shaw and his soldiers dying together. And it is what we understand is the perfect ending. And they have given their lives, as Kelly was saying, not because it's a patriotic duty, but because they're men. And they are men together. And so this is, this is one of those films that can engage all of us with a powerful message. So David, I, I want to come back to you because I want to talk about, there's the title card at the end that says the fort never fell, which was a little bit confusing to me because yeah. the South lost the war. So I need you to <laughs> help me out here. Um, but I need you to draw some broader themes for us from your expertise sure. about enslaved men fighting in the Civil War. Can you help me out here? Sure, and if I could just as a very, very quick segue. This is the first time I've seen this film Hold your mic, mic up. I'm oh, sorry. This is the first time I've seen this film on a big screen since no, I was 18 like or 19. Thank you. And you talk about entry points and, and character identification. And I remember um, going to this film because this was the film with Denzel Washington and, and Morgan Freeman. And, you know, sitting there watching it, I remember it occurring to me that they, wow, these other people are in it and they're expecting me to take Ferris Bueller and Wesley from Princess Bride seriously, <laughs> which is cool, and it turned out to be, it worked well. Yeah. Uh, but this, this notion of identification is, is clearly there. So I think what makes the Battle of Fort Wagner important in history is that the 54th was there. That were they not there, it would have been another you know, tragic battle where so many lives were lost on both sides. Uh, my understanding is that uh, when it, it was Part of the cleanup at the end of the war is sort of Sherman's making his march to the sea and, and moving up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I think uh, if this were made today, which is to say if there was the appetite in Hollywood to put not only black people near the center, but as the sort of focus of the story, we would have seen uh, reflections of the purpose of this war for black soldiers and the communities they represented. 
you know, here in Washington, D.C., I mean, we see so much of this sort of uh, reverberating. The Shaw neighborhood, where the Black Civil War Memorial is around U Street, is, is named for Robert Gould Shaw. And there's a big monument, mainly of black soldiers, there at U Street in uh, Vermont, I believe it is. Um, the famous picture is a very famous picture as you often see in textbooks when they talk about black soldiers in the Civil War of uh, maybe a dozen or 20 black men lined up shoulder to shoulder standing side by side with a white clapboard building behind them. That's Fort Lincoln, just on the other side of the Anacostia. You know, black men from Montgomery County and Prince George's in Washington, D.C. Many of them runaway slaves. Um, I think were this again made today, there would have been more complexity to the I don't, I don't want to call them foils, but the contraband were much more complex. And, and many times the contraband camps were these men's families who had run with them as they were sort of mustered into the... And, and certainly, you know, poor Snowflake. Um, you know, he, uh, the idea that um, because of his freedom, and, and perhaps I'm reading too much, it's, you know, I'm not a film critic, but he's, it's almost as though is his lack of an enslaved experience has stripped away his manliness vis-a-vis -vis everybody else in the film and nothing could have been further from the truth if we understand who these, these people were. So I often see films like this and if we think about where our nation was at in 1989 or the late 1980s, the things that we were sort of moving through, it was, it was needful, it was, it was useful to us to sort of navigate uh, what we were trying to accomplish in recasting sort of not simply uh, African Americans and people of color in the present, but also historically, because much of what we had inherited then and still deal with now is a black past that was created in service to the lost cause that was necessary for the construction of Jim Crow at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, even the notion of, of, of black sage, sage black men having to be white haired, I was laughing, I hope I didn't disturb anybody, you know, Frederick Douglass is why he was 43 years old when this happened. He certainly wasn't the Frederick Douglass that we have inherited in, in that way. So with that wonderful yeah. hair and yeah. speaking yeah. of having wonderful hair, I can um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying there's something that actually um, I, I actually kind of want Russell and Kelly both to address this. There, there was a scene that really stuck with me for a lot of different reasons. And that is uh, when the 54th is ordered to to burn down the houses. Uh, but we are also introduced to the other black soldiers, the contraband. Uh, these are soldiers who are ill-disciplined. These are soldiers uh, who want to take things. And we are, we are shown them as if they are in relief to each other. Uh, and we get a moment with racism, anti-Semitism, and a Me Too movement a moment all wrapped up in the same thing. Um, but but what really stood out is that it was really there were a lot of things to unpack there for me. I was looking at well-disciplined soldiers as opposed to ill-disciplined soldiers who could not have been well-disciplined soldiers had they not had uh, the commandant, the colonel who was white. Can you talk a little bit about that, Russell? Um. Yes, thank you. And even uh, when we filmed uh, the scene in Darien, Georgia, we actually went to the outskirts of Darien to, we built that town, you know, as, as false fronts, as they would call it in the movie business. And we put uh, flame boxes behind the windows so we could do multiple takes of the houses burning and then we could repaint them if we had to go back again. But the Reedville camp scene is where they went through what we would call boot camp, uh, the 54th. And so merging these men from just being kind of, some of them were freed men and some of them, you know, ran away from the fields, but they had to become a unit in the military and they had to live by military guidelines. And of course, once they got south, the contraband, as they say in the dialogue, were literally just free from the slaves and said, okay, if you want three square meals and some clothes to put on and a rifle. But the difference was their commanders weren't interested in putting them in real battle. So it wasn't really um, 
shown in the film that they would be capable of holding their ground and fighting in a disciplined manner the way the military guidelines were at the time, whereas the 54th had come through traditional military discipline. They were taught to stand and fight. They, they basically went through what would be special forces uh, the SEAL camp nowadays. Uh, so once they were under fire, they knew to hold their ground and, and to listen to their commanding officer's words. And, and also, I, I gained so much more appreciation while we were shooting the film because, you know, you're standing not even to that next break in the uh, actual uh, congregation seats from somebody who's got a 57 caliber musket. And part of that discipline came from, in the Revolutionary War, the the, the guns weren't as powerful, so you might have actually been safe at this distance. By the time they got to the infield, yeah, you were just wait. sitting duck. You were so, supposed to wait for the whites of their eyes. Yeah, before yeah, you yeah. Fired forget about revolution. that. You know, so at least they found cover later. They understand, and, and, and but this happens over and over again in military history. I mean, World War One, they were standing there in front of blistering machine gun fire, and they figured out, you know, we better hide behind something. What oh, did you get? At? Kelly, yes, and then I know David wants to chime in. Uh, y Yes, and in fact, would uh, love to even hear more about the complexity of uh, who these contraband represented. But one of the things that strikes me in this scene, in fact, as you describe the quote unquote well disciplined soldiers uh, in contrast to those soldiers who are not well disciplined, the contraband, is that what you have, it seems to me, is this juxtaposition of views in regard to uh, black people and in regard in particular in this instance to the black man. And so that you see on the one hand the way in which the white soldier, uh, Montgomery, I guess, uh, treats or his expectations of the men under his charge and his expectations, as he indeed calls them these monkeys, his expectation is in fact that these are beasts and that they are not human. And so he indeed releases them to do what beasts do. And what you also see in, in, in picking up on what David said is the beginning of this kind of construction that will follow uh, well beyond, uh, obviously, the Civil War. In this construction, as you see these black men attacking these white women, and then, of course, the white women's response. And this becomes the excuse mm -hmm. for, of course, what will be lynching and other kind of uh, Jim Crow era terror. On the other hand, you see this other viewpoint uh, from, again, we're look, seeing this now. This scene is being carried out for us through white eyes, right? And so or through the white viewpoint. So you see this other. There's, Matthew Broderick, Shaw on the other hand, who indeed perhaps has this view that no, these are not animals, these are not monkeys, these are indeed human beings. And he attempts, he wrestles with now, he doesn't, he wrestles with, you know, sort of his understanding and treatment of them as men. But what, what struck me was indeed this juxtaposition uh, uh, between these two perceptions from a white vantage point of uh, black people, and in this instance, black men. David. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and I, I believe they were attempting, the, the writers and directors were attempting a much more complicated conversation than perhaps the medium might uh, allow. Um, the, 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 the village scene there in Beaufort, uh, you sort of have, you have this sort of uh, juxtaposition of one group that has been sincerely approached, the 54th, and this other group that has been insincerely approached, but the lesson or the message becomes, I don't know if it's one of regression or emergence of sort of a quote unquote natural state. The Kentucky born journal, uh, uh, Colonel as he presents himself uh, does not give a sincere effort and his, his outfit is the, is the result the uh, 54th has a different approach than it. But again, to my mind, uh, it gives short shift to the natural inclinations of the enslaved people themselves, whether they found themselves in the contraband outfit or they found themselves in the 54th. Here in D Washington, D.C., 
Abraham Lincoln tested emancipation here in Washington, D.C., because as president, he had the authority over the federal city. This is why slavery was outlawed in Washington in April of 1862, as opposed to the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. On New Year's Eve night, December 31st, 1862, just outside the White House, there was a large gathering to count down the end of slavery for the Confederate South. And the Washington Star and other newspapers uh, uh, recorded the uh, recollections and observations of, of, of blacks gathered there. And many of them said things that allowed us to see that these were thinking, aware, engaged, politically you know, uh, uh, aware people. Uh, as some saying something as, as sort of common as, I'm glad God didn't let this war end before midnight when my people in Virginia can be free. <laughs> or others who gave similar testimony to the men around the campfire. You know, I've, uh, I've lost my family, my wife's been sold away, but no more of that in, in, in six hours. So there is a complicated nuance to the, confeder to the uh, contraband camp, to the average person who is entrapped with, in slavery but sees and understands this war as an opportunity to destroy slavery that perhaps this medium doesn't allow. You know, the, uh, the regiment, the 54th, and the other USCT troops all emerged in 1863, but records demonstrate that within two weeks of the firing on Fort Sumter, there are black men presenting themselves to Lincoln in the White House saying, we are ready to go, and he's saying just, no, not yet, we're, we're not there yet, so. I want to turn back to the subject of the, the prayer meeting, Greg. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of salvation and redemption in this film? Well, we are, in, in any kind of story, we have what's a, a sort of character arc um, from what a character needs to learn or what they need to become to what they end up being. And um, so the main characters in this film have a movement that they have to take from uh, brokenness to wholeness, from, uh, from wherever they are to wherever it is that they're supposed to be. And this is a movie about becoming, particularly for the, the black soldiers. And so you've got the three sort of main black characters, and they're framed over and over again in compositions uh, around the tree, uh, so that they're, they're all in, in shot at the same time, except for the close-ups on, on the person speaking or praying. But for, for each of those people, we get um, some sort of movement on their part because it, it really is a, a climactic kind of moment um, that, that ends up with Denzel's character you know, proclaiming, we're men, you know, we're men, aren't we? And that's the thing that he has been struggling with, that he has been trying to claim for himself. Uh, and I saw it much more strongly in this viewing uh, because uh, when we talked with Janet uh, in a conference call a couple of weeks ago, um, she was talking about how she and her mom, as they were writing the script, sort of arm wrestled with Denzel about his character through the whole time that they were working on the film. And he wanted to create this, this really powerful character arc. And he does. He, he becomes the person who sees himself as worthy, uh, who sees himself as a man, who sees himself as willing to pick up the flag at the end of the battle, not because he wants to save the Union, but because he has found his family, the people he loves, the people who have let him live into his destiny, that he is a human being. I have to tell you, um, I'm an Andre Brower fan. <laughs> uh, from all those, uh, for all those years, from Homicide, Life on the Street, and Frank Pembleton made me cry more times than I'm almost willing to admit. And to see him in this role is, is just, Wow, uh, a powerful young Andre Brower. But Russell, I, I am watching this and watching this as, as a middle-aged woman and I am looking at why Denzel earned that Oscar and I'm looking at his face when he's being beaten mm -hmm. for having gone to get shoes. And you told me something interesting about that scene. When we... Yeah, when we filmed that, I was way far back from camera. So I didn't see the tear until I saw the movie in 70 millimeter at the plit. Uh, 
But what, what I did see while we were filming is even while Carrie Elwes, who played the major, is off camera, while we're doing the whipping scene, and of course the whipping scene is affected by it because post-production sound effects, when we were whipping Denzel, you didn't hear anything because it was just, you know, like the yarn that you would, you know, knit a sweater with. So he wasn't feeling anything, that was real acting. But Carrie Elwes, Major Forbes, would break out in tears over and over again on set because the, the tension on set with the, 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 the cadet, I mean, not the cadet corps, but the 54th reenactors, I mean, he was overcome with the actual emotion of what his character was really experiencing. And so when we had to take our time to come back around to get the scenes of him because we had to get his eyes clear again. And I had never really seen an actor, not on camera, get that caught up in, into the actual scene ever before. I mean, I had done that once or twice, but not the actual people with the Screen Actors Guild card. So that really impressed me about uh, Carrie Elwes. We have to wrap up. So David, um, I wanna ask you about your closing thoughts and some, sum up for me what you would like me to take away from the historical context of glory. Sure, I think uh, that as, well, it's a dual historical context. It's a, uh, this as a sort of cult, a production of history, a presentation of history. I think it is important and comprehensive and should be applauded for its, its effort uh, to uh, bring into what is normally uh, a war story, the human complexity that really has nothing to do with being at battle, but more about being humans. But then there's also the historical context as a cultural artifact of the 1980s and sort of emerging from the, f the first sort of post-civil rights fever that we um, all uh, sort of assumed that we were under with the uh, er election of, of, of Ronald Reagan and the sort of death of the civil rights art. Um, we still had work to do and we seem to be embracing it if these things, these artifacts from our time tell us anything about our mindsets at that point. So. Greg, what about you? Well, you know, my final question that I posed uh, at the beginning of our evening together had to do with what can we carry away from this film that came out 30 years ago. And as I was reflecting on it tonight, what hit me hardest was what are we willing to do? You know, what are we willing to give our lives to or our lives for? What are we willing to start knowing that we may not see the end of it? Um, and just thinking about the, the sort of uh, thematic way of, of understanding this film, that people were willing to give themselves and their lives to something that they perceived to be so much larger than themselves. And, and it wasn't about the country, although it was. It was about each other and about true equality. And, and I think that would be my takeaway tonight for us to sort of meditate on what is it that we are willing to give ourselves to, to see change happen. I'm gonna bat to Russell because I'm gonna ask Kelly to close us out. Russell, what do, what do you want us um, from your perspective? I would say with the historical errors that are in the film, and if you come to the workshop tomorrow, we might point a couple of them out. Uh, it woke a lot of people to the participation of African Americans in not only the Civil War, but every uh, military engagement that the now United States of America has fought. Uh, I will be wearing my crew jacket tomorrow. And on a flight from California back uh, to this coast, uh, there was a white lady sitting right behind me. She said, oh, I saw Glory was such a wonderful film, and I think every African American should see the film. And I said, you're right. And I said, it's almost maybe more important that every white American see the film. And she says, well, no. I, I said, no, yes. I said, because both populations have been lied to. We were told we didn't do anything but pick cotton, and you all were told that you did everything but pick cotton. So somewhere in the middle are, is a narrative that's actually accurate, and I want to say really quickly, there's a gentleman that I tried to get to come up with us. We walked down the, the, the cobblestone path where you, in the movie, the 54th gets their uniforms. And of course, that's supposed to be Boston, and it's really Savannah. And he told me about his ancestors, the Irish, when they were loading the ships, but my ancestors could not load the ships because if we got hurt, somebody had to be paid some money. If the Irish got hurt, they just say, bring me another Irishman. But right there, 
the tension between the two groups wasn't really be because the Irish and the African Americans didn't like each other. It's because it was it was necessary to keep these two groups of people at odds with each other. They could not coalesce. They had to be seen as enemies. See the film Mate One. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, Mate One. You talking about Mate One? Mm -hmm. That's an aside. Is that, is that the next, is that the next screen? It's, no. Oh, cool. <laughs> that would be to Greg. Um, we've had a great evening. Um, what I would like to do is do my closing thing, and then I'm gonna ask Kelly to close us out with her final thoughts and um, good wishes for us. So I want to remind everybody that this is night one of A Long, Long Way, our film weekend. Please join us tomorrow night, if you can, for our second film, Harriet, starring Academy Award nominee Cynthia Erivo. Don't forget, tomorrow night, we start an hour earlier here at 6 p.m., one hour earlier here if you'd like to see Harriet. Kelly Brown Douglas. Thank you. So you've given me the hard task of closing it out. Indeed. I think you know, as we talk about this historical film in the context, not only the context, the history uh, and the historical context that was trying to be presented on film, but the context in which we see the film and view the film. And we view this film this evening in the context in which we have uh, focused on the legacy since 1619, right? The legacy of slavery uh, that begins for us uh, with the landing of the white lion. And so as I think about that legacy, I think about really the question that stood out for me in this film, in the comment, as we think about what's our legacy and what is our responsibility to the legacy. And Denzel Washington's character, and maybe perhaps it wasn't his character, said that none of us are clean. And so what does it mean in this time to ante up and to kick in? What does it mean to ante up and to kick in? And so I'll leave us with these prayerful words from a song that has meaning in this legacy, which we carry forward, you'll recognize it. And so we say, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in thy path, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.